All right, picking up a little bit more from the book, um, again, past the history, a little bit of repetition in this lecture, but I think that's kind of good when it comes to genetics. So when we talk to gen gen genetics, once again, we're talking about inheritance, we're talking about traits, we're talking about breeding, if you will. We're talking about how traits are inherited from one generation to the next. That's what genetics is all about. The basic unit of heredity, like we said, is the gene. And what we now know is that the gene is composed of DNA located on chromosomes, right? Now, if a gene exists in more than one form, that is known, once again, as allele. We saw that in the last lecture. The genetic makeup of the individual is known as the genotype. What are their two alleles, one from each parent? And the actual physical manifestation, once again, is the phenotype. I need you to definitely be able to differentiate between those two in your head, genotype and phenotype. So things that we're going to go over, not just in this module, but this whole chapter, so over the next two weeks. So we're going to definitely, once again, nail in your head what's the difference between genotype and a phenotype, and be able to determine that in an individual. What are the genotypes for homozygous, recessive, and dominant individuals and a heterozygous individual? Well, we introduced those concepts of homozygous and heterozygous last time. We will get deeper into it um, in, the, in the coming lectures. Be able to draw a Punnett square. We saw that briefly as well, but we're also going to be looking at two-trait cross and sexing crosses, so we're going to have to modify it. We're going to look at uh, diseases that are actually related to genetics. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease, Huntington disease, sickle cell disease, PKU. How are each of those diseases inherited? What is polygenic? Poly meaning meaning, and poly meaning many, many and uh, genic obviously genes. Polygenic inheritance, multifactorial trait, a trait where it's going to be multi genes that are going to affect it. Sex-linked inheritance. That's going to have to do with the the certain traits that are actually on the genes that uh, determine your gender, your X and Y chromosomes. Uh, we're going to talk about different um, X-linked recessive disorders. So these are, once again, sex-linked here. We're going to talk about codominance, incomplete dominance, and genetic profiling. So once again, these are things that we're going to be talking about over the next two weeks. And just to get your wheels spinning, you know, think about yourself. What about your own inheritance? Do you have a widow's peak? So in other words, does you, in your hairline, uh, does it tend to come forward like this, or is it more straight across? Do you, are your earlobes attached, the base of your earlobes attached or unattached? Do you have short or long fingers? Do you have freckles? Can you roll your tongue? Do you have a hitchhiker's thumb, which means it kind of, not when you throw your thumb back, it actually looks like it kind of hyperextends. So, my very poor drawing of a thumb. Sorry, there's a fingernail if that helps. Um, hopefully you get the idea. So these are all genetically inherited. So last time we looked at Mendel, and we saw he wasn't just some boring little monk off by himself, and for some reason started counting peas and once again he didn't just look at peas he looked at many things but he didn't just start counting plants he actually was there very specifically to study breeding and was very bright and sh showed us a great example of a really good experimental design and a, a lot of very good judgment on his part as far as conducting his experiments but what did he show true breeding individuals and once again we determined what a true breeding individual was is that if it's self-crossed the progeny will only be with the parental phenotype. And remember we said that it probably took him years to self-cross peas, like round peas long enough, generation after generation after generation to ensure he only gets round, right? So it probably took him years to set up that test until he finally got a true breeding individual. But then if we take true breeding individuals but with different traits. So once again, it took him years for years to develop a whole bunch of round true breeding, and then he crossed it with a true breeding wrinkled, right? What did he do? 
He statistically analyzed what happened when he bred two different true breeding individuals. So, Mendel's first law, we didn't explicitly state it, we implied a few of these last time, the law of segregation. So there's four principles of inheritance that come with his first law, the law of segregation. First of all, that genes exist in alternative forms. Those are those alleles, an example, once again, that we've been symbolizing as R or big R or little r, right? And that organisms will always have two alleles for each trait, one from each parent. The two alleles segregate out during meiosis. And as a reminder, meiosis is making of gametes, making of the sex cells, making of the sperm and the egg, resulting in gametes that carry only one allele for a given trait. So if two alleles of an organism are different, one will be expressed, the dominant, and one will be silent. And we saw that once again if we did cross the two true breeding, a true breeding round and a true breeding wrinkled, all and we crossed them, what did we got? What did we get? We only saw the dominant round. Homozygous, two copies of the same allele. We saw that once again, either here or here as our examples. Heterozygous, two different alleles. Here. So once again, it's just language, it's just terms that I do need you to know, and I know I'm being um, I'm repetitious here, but these are terms I do need you to get. So I'm just going to use them over and over again. Genotype. Genes for a particular trait written with symbols. Well, once again, we saw that. The alleles are the alternative forms of a specific gene at the same position, the position on the DNA. Now we're getting a little more specific. On the DNA, the position of those genes, right, is called a locus. Uh, for example, and the allele for the unattached earlobes and the attached earlobes are going to be on, once again, that same spot on the DNA, right? And once again, those alleles occur in pairs. Dominant, once again, the dominant gene will be expressed and mask the recessive gene. While the recessive will only be expressed when it has two types, when it is homozygous for itself. Homozygous dominant, two dominant alleles. Homozygous recessive, two recessive alleles. The only time we're actually going to see the recessive trait come out is when it is homozygous recessive. And heterozygous, one dominant allele, one, one recessive allele. So once again, more of the same stuff, just put slightly differently. Phenotype, once again, that physical manifestation, the physical or outward expression of those genes, the genotype. So, example would be earlobes. Okay, so unattached earlobes, okay, are the dominant phenotype. So my genotype, if I have a genotype big E, big E, well, I have two alleles, both saying unattached, so that's what my physical manifestation is. I have a genotype big E lily. I have one allele that un says unattached, one that says attached, but unattached is dominant, so that's what the phenotype is going to be. And lily lily, that's my genotype. Two alleles, both attached earlobes, and that's recessive, that's when I'm going to see it. So think about what might your genotype be, what might your phenotype be. So as an example, once again, the exact same thing we just saw. So from in this first example, in this first column right here, from dad, here's the sperm, I have big E, mom also big E, so they're both giving, in this case, unattached right alleles so the genotype in the offspring is big E big E and hey yes we are unattached up here in the middle here we have dad donating an attached right allele mom also giving attached we have homozygous recessive genotype and we now have an attached earlobe. 
But then over here, mom, here, the little that's in the egg there is unattached, dad, attached. I get this heterozygous over here, but it's the, that unattached that's going to be dominant. So the phenotype, once again, is an unattached earlobe. So once again, think about your inheritance. Anything from, there's that widow's peak again I mentioned earlier, that kind of, and the hairline versus more just straight across. Attached earlobe versus going kind of into the back of the cheek there versus detached, right? Can you roll your tongue or can't you? All these, once again, are carried, carried on your genes as well as eye color, going from the deep blue to the deep brown. So, a one trait cross is only going to consider the inheritance of one characteristic. So, looking in example, here's a cross of, say, Widow's Peak. And uh, while here, a two, tra two trait cross considers the inheritance of two characteristics. So now we might be talking Widow's Peak and Can You Roll Your Tongue? So gametes can only carry one allele. So once again, when I say gamete, those are the sex cells. They're only, that's the sperm and egg, can only carry one allele. So if an individual has the genotype, okay, big W, little w, what are the possible gametes that this person can pass on? Well. That person can either pass on a W, say this is a man here, well, half of sperm's gonna pass on the uppercase W, big W, and half of them will carry on the lowercase W. But the thing is, is that it will not pass on both. This could be one or the other because they're gonna divide up in meiosis. So here's freckles. So in this case, no freckles, being recessive. Okay, so here's the man, here's the woman. They undergoes meiosis. So now the sperm is only gonna carry one allele. This is the gamete right here. Right here are the gametes, here's the sperm. Here's the egg, right here are the gametes. They can only carry one allele and then they're gonna pass that when they come together, here's the offspring. Now, we showed this also before, a little bit nicer than my picture than I showed you before. Here, here's a Punnett square, which is just a basic grid, a diagram that shows the crosses between individuals. So, here we have, once again, talking freckles. We have two parents. Both of them are have the phenotype that they have freckles. So that's the dark red. But notice, in our example here, that both dad and mom are heterozygous for that. So how do we find out what is the probability? And here's the key with Punnett squares. It's all about probability. It's all about statistics, right? What's the probability that an offspring will have a particular genotype and phenotype? We're looking for both. So if we know the genotype for the parents, and hence we know the phenotype, Okay, so for the sperm, we know my two possibilities for the sperm, sperm are either going to get capital F or lowercase f. I'm on the sperm side here, the, man, the guy side. Same with the female. The eggs are either going to be big F or little f, female side, the egg side. Well, what, what's my ratio here? Well, if I have two heterozygotes, my phenotypical ratio my phenotypic ratio is three to one as far as the chances are three to one that the offspring is gonna have freckles. Only a, only a one in four chance that, that the child is not gonna have freckles. So what would a Punnett square involving a man with a genotype, once again, heterozygous FF and a woman F look like. Same thing we just saw, freckles, no freckles. I want you to just be able to practice these things.
the genotypic ratio is the number of offspring with the same genotype. Okay, well, we saw the phenotypic ratio. What about the genotypic now? What is the ratio here? All right, the genotypic ratio is we have one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. We can see that. One, two, and one again, right? That's the genotypic ratio. We already saw the phenotypic ratio on the previous, on the previous slide, three with freckles, here, here, and here, and once again, one without. So a monohybrid cross is an experimental cross in which the parents are identically hetero, uh, heterozygous at one gene pair. So that's what we actually just looked at. That's a monohybrid cross. How would we get that? Well, we would get it by an example would be two parents that are homozygous for each, dominant and recessive. So we saw that's how we how uh, Mendel got it on his first cross. So we can see over in this ratio over here, once again, here we have a heterozygous male and then a homozygous and this color actually should be actually the, it's the wrong representative color here. This is homozygous recessive female and now if we look at the phenotypic ratio it's a one to one over here. Once again, I want you to just start practicing these things. There's some examples in the book as well. Practice these things so you can get an idea about how these ratios work out. And if we want to, once again, get a better view of how do we get these initial ratios and so forth, how we, from these gametes from the parents, this is meiosis. Meiosis happens in two steps, two stages. So we have our initial cell. We have our initial cell, and notice that it has four. It has four chromosomes here. And what's going to happen is that these four chromosomes are all going to actually undergo um, DNA synthesis and, and replicate themselves. And they're going to actually create these little the X-looking things what's going to happen is the ones representing Widow's Peak are going to line up, pair up next to each other and the ones representing short fingers are going to pair up. Remember because we have one pair here, one pair here, one from each of its parents. Okay, They're going to line up either this way or this way, where we see blues all on one side, reds on the other, this one they cross over, right? They're different. Those are the two options on how they can line up. Then they divide up into cells here. And now there are haploid cells. They have half as many. I started with four chromosomes. One, two, three, four, right? Here, I still, even in the lineup stage, I have one, two, three, four. But now I have one, two, and one, two. And then they split one more time, and they still have, because we divide down the middle, these are exact copies on either side here. All right, we're gonna learn more about meiosis later, but now we have one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. Notice it's half as many then as what I started with here. This is known as a diploid cell. And these gametes, which once again will be the sperm and the eggs down here, right? These are known as haploid cells. So just notice that I'm going from four chromosomes to one and look at all the different variations I can get all the different possibilities starting with this one diploid cell with just four chromosomes. So here we are with Mendel's second law of independent assortment. 
And it goes back to the pictures we were just looking at. A dihybrid cross is when we're once again looking at alleles of unlinked genes, all right? And we're seeing once again those genes that are unlinked, they are not on the same chromosomes, sort independently. And I'm just gonna go back real quick and we can see that once again. So the genes represented on each one of these four chromosomes at the top, well, they're all going to separate all independently. Therefore, the principles of the monohybrid cross can be extended to the dihybrid cross. We kind of already hinted at that earlier. So the statistical calculations just work out the same, except now we're working with two sets of, of genes once again. So the probability of a particular genotype appearing in that F2 generation, not F1, but F2, and the F2 progeny can be determined by calculating the number of different gamete combinations that will create the genotype. So once again, we're just talking statistics. The probability of producing a genotype that requires the occurrence of two independent traits is equal to the product, and that's the key here, product multiplication of the individual probabilities occurring. So basically, for two independent traits, you can sell each to be an individual. Now that might sound like a bit of gobbledygook. Let's look at it, okay? So here's another example of a dihybrid cross where we're looking at both widow's peak and fingers. So in this first case here, we have widow's peak and long fingers and they're both homozygous. And now we have widow's peak and, uh, excuse me, short fingers are over here, long fingers are over here. And this is no widow's peak, long fingers over here, also homozygous. And then they create the gametes. In this case, there's only one option for both of these. And then we have our, um, our F1 generation. So in a dihybrid cross, an experimental cross that usually involving parents that are homozygous for two different genes and results in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 genotypic ratio for the offspring. Because once again, if we do this here, um, here is the possibilities for the F1 generation, but we're also wanting to go on to F2 generation. So here are the F1 gametes. And we can see we have 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio as far as widow's peak and short fingers. Okay, so let's see if we can see this here. We have one here, 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 one here and one here. Let's count that up real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And how did I get that? I'm looking for the ones that will have at least one capital W, one upper, and one capital S, the two dominant. Then we'll have three widow's peak, but long fingers. That's where I'm going to have a capital W, but we're going to have homozygous recessive here. So I'm going to put check marks here, right? And a check mark here. And a check mark down here. There's my other three. Then straight hairline and short fingers. Well, that would be the case where I have homozygous here and uh, recessive and at least one capital S here. So I'm going to put a check mark or I'll put a circle here. One and a two and three. And then lastly, recessive on both sides, right here. So once again, if we just put out all the different possibilities from those F1 gametes, um, then we're gonna get within the F2 generation that nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio. So not terribly hard, it just, it does take some practice. 
Now, a couple of variations on Mendelian genetics, and actually we're going to get into this more next week. Once again, I'm just introducing concepts a little early. Incomplete dominance is where the offspring, the progeny phenotypes, the physical manifestation is, is a blend, uh, where it's not 100% round, it's not 100% wrinkled as our examples go. Um, that so where the phenotype of the heterozygote is just once again some kind of intermediate there's not really it's not a complete dominance and there are one over the other co-dominance is when more than one option is dominant we're going to see this with our blood types each allele is fully dominant you have both traits fully but if both dom uh, dominants are present you have the phenotypical expression of both simultaneously and once again key example there are the our blood types and we'll get into that so, so once again I, I, I told you with genetics there's all these rules and statistics and these math and we learn all the rules but then we learn about all the examples of where we break the rules and these are examples right here penetrance and um, expressivity well remember the physical manifestation the phenotype is a combination of both genetics and environment so Skin color, um, obviously usually genetic uh, component there, but also an environmental component, how much sun you get and what have you. So penetrance is the percent of individuals in a population that are actually carrying the allele and that actually express the associated phenotype. So that who actually express it, that shows you how much the, the genetics are actually taking the role. And expressivity is the degree in which the phenotype associated with the genotype is expressed in the actual individual individual so how much is that gene being expressed in the in the individual also next week we're going to talk about those inherited disorders some are recessive disorders the, the main ones we're going to be concerned with are recessive alleles so often they're a non-issue if you're heterozygous and it's a recessive disease you're not going to have the phenotype and if you are like that and um, heterozygous, you're a carrier. You don't actually have the disease, but you're a carrier for it. The only way you're going to have a disease, have the disease, if it is a recessive disease, is if you are homozygous recessive. A dominant disease means that you automatically have the disease if you have that dominant allele. Typically, they are late acting. Otherwise if they're a traumatic disease. Um, obviously you wouldn't survive early in life. The only time we tend to see dominant uh, disorders, inherited disorders, are when they're late acting, like Hunt Huntington's. Um, also, sex determination. Um, when we talk, look at the chromosomes, we actually have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes in humans. 23 from each parent. 22 of which are known as autosomes, the non-sex chromosomes, and then of course we have two sex chromosomes, one from each parent. XX in females, XY in males. Genes that are located on X or Y chromosomes ex um, exhibit non-Mendelian inheritance or sex-linked inheritance, and once again we'll get into that more next time. Specifically, recessive genes on the X chromosome will produce a recessive phenotype whenever they are in males because the male doesn't have a dominant to mask them. So affected males cannot pass traits to sons but will pass it to daughters who are going to be carriers and they'll pass it on to 50% of her sons. And we'll see an example of this once again just introducing concepts right now. We'll see examples of this next week a lot clearer especially when it comes to color blindness. That's it for now. Um, a lot of stuff in a little bit of time, read the book. Uh, once again, I know because we are talking some numbers and math, it can get a little confusing. Don't let it overwhelm you. And be sure to email me if you have any questions.